three monthly paying dividend stocks. You guys really enjoyed the first video, which I appreciate. And so I'm doing a part two, which is three more monthly paying dividend stocks I think everyone should know about. These are high yielding, as you can see on screen. And I included a fourth stock that I'll talk about at the end that I think is going to explode in the next couple of years. But back to these high yielding dividend stocks. The first one is near 8% yield. The second one is a little bit over 8% yield. And the third one is an 11% dividend yield, which I know is skeptical for a couple people having double digit yields, but I've owned this one the longest of the four actually, and it has been performing extremely well for me. Now that doesn't mean it's gonna keep performing well, but we'll get into all of that. So if you guys are anything like me, you love seeing that notification that dividends have been deposited to your account. I love seeing my account grow. It gets me super, super pumped and makes me wanna invest more even if I don't have the money, which is never a good idea. What we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about four metrics when it comes to dividend stocks that you need to know when you're researching these. First, we're gonna look at the price action and the dividend yield. So that can be done on many different websites. I just use Google. I use their chart feature to see exactly how the stock price has been performing over the past 10 years to max even more than that because you want to know what has been going on to avoid yield traps because there are a lot of dividend yield traps that I see all over social media. People pointing out it has an 18, 20, 25% dividend yield. And if you look back on the price history of that company, you would have lost money had you invested. So sometimes these yield traps, they boast these crazy high dividend yields, but in reality, you will lose more than you would make in dividends just on the price depreciation of the stock. Then we'll look at the dividend history. Another good option for uh, rooting out yield trap stocks. We'll see how they've been performing. One of the most important things that I find with the dividend history is seeing how these companies perform during hard times in the market. So there's been a number of market crashes and seeing how these companies came out of it, if they prioritized their dividend, if they were able to continue growing it, how management took these tasks on is really, really important. And I think it says a lot about the company. And even though you cannot tell the future of a stock by the past, I think it gives us a better idea and it helps us um, understand the management side of these companies. Then we will look at the drip calculator, a really, really important tool when it comes to dividend investing, in my opinion, because you can calculate with reinvesting dividends, which is one of the most important parts of compounding. So we're going to look at the drip calculator. That'll be a quick calculation. I'll show you guys that website for if you want to do that um, yourselves. And then lastly, we'll look at the investor presentation, which is, I think, a very underutilized part of investing. You should be able to go through and look at these presentations and understand what the company is telling us. It's literally free fact about the company and a lot of the times you can find out so much information from this and you can even fact check information that you've heard from TikTok, from from instagram and from youtube so we're going to go through how to read some of the stuff on those and, and what i like to find it basically tells us a lot about the companies which i think is really really important and before we do all that if you guys find anything useful in the video if you could please like the video that would help me a bunch let me know in the comments what stock you think is the best which one you think is the worst or if you own any of these because these ones are kind of popular some more than other others but i want to know who owns what and see what my um, fellow investors are purchasing at this time so i appreciate you guys for doing that yes like the video if you don't mind but let's go ahead and jump into this first insane monthly paying dividend etf yes it's an etf Ticker JEPI, the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF. That is a mouthful. This is the only ETF in the group I'm talking about today, um, and for good reason. JEPI is really, really popular on social media. I've seen a lot of people rave about it, and again, I am a fan. I did sell how many shares I owned in this. I can't remember when I sold because I've been moving some assets around and moving stuff into retirement accounts, but I will be looking to scoop up some JEPI shares here pretty quick. Now, JEPI first came onto my radar, I believe in 2022 when it was, when it was one of the most purchased ETFs on the market behind SCHD. And so it really blew up that year currently. It says their yield is about a little bit under 8%, like a 7.7% .7 yield like we talked about earlier, which is phenomenal. It's really, really strong. It initially had like a near 10% yield, so it has come down a little bit, but let's look at the price action. So up 5% in the last year, nothing crazy. On the five-year chart, they are still up, but they're down from their high of almost $64 by about 10%. So it's been relatively consistent paying off that dividend and staying within this $50 to $60 range. I do like these ETFs. They don't have a ton of price action. 
And when it comes to Jeppy, it has only been around since 2020. So it's not a very old ETF. It's definitely new, but people love it because it has the JP Morgan name. And with that popular name comes trust, which isn't necessarily a good thing, but it is something to note that JP Morgan is well known and they are, uh, I would say a fan favorite, especially of the older investors. So when you're looking into a fund like Jeppy, you know that it is a higher risk fund, but it is by JP Morgan. So you weigh the pros with the cons. Um, which I think is extremely important. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump into their dividend history and take a look at these recent and past payouts. Using SeekingAlpha.com, we can see, yes, their dividend yields 7.68%. Uh, their annual payout is $4.36 a share, which is phenomenal. Now, they don't have dividend growth. That's the thing. Because this is an ETF, their growth is going to be all over the place. It's a covered call ETF. So if we track their dividend history, which is, like I said, extremely important, it has fallen a little bit. We have seen it coming down because it was about 61 cents and the most recent payments were 30. So it has been cut by about 50%. But of course, when it comes to ETFs, this is not an actual dividend cut. It is just the dividend going down, which as we've seen over the last 5, 10 years, it has bounced around quite a bit. So a lot of that does depend on the price action and how the stock has been doing. Um, but if we go down here, we can see 30 cents, 30 cents, 42, 40 cents, uh, 36, 36, 34, um, even a low of 29. So we definitely are getting to the lower end of the dividend in 2021, 2022, 2022 was a really good year for JEPI 2021, kind of the same kind of thing, a little bit lower yield than what we're looking at now. So when it comes to these ETFs, I do like them for the monthly income, but it is not consistent. And that is definitely something to note. It's only been paying dividends for three years. And so when we look at their growth, it's not going to be any real growth. But something that is really important is, like I said, 2022 was a great year for them, is this yield payout so far. So 2022, they had a 7.6% annual yield, which I think is phenomenal. In 2021, 8.11%. So they jumped up. 2020, huge year, almost 13% dividend yield throughout the year, which is insane and then 2023 we did drop down 27 percent year over year losing some of that dividend um and now paying out about an 8.5 percent yield for last year which again at 8.5 percent yield is good i would not complain about that but if you're buying into this fund thinking you're going to get 13 and you get eight and a half that's where it's going to get a little bit tricky and some people may not be as interested especially because there is a much less um, strong dividend history here. We do not really have much dividend history, but that JP Morgan name makes this extremely popular. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use a drip calculator to see how this thing has performed over the span of its trading life. So I'm on dividendchannel.com using this drip calculator. Uh, when it comes to Jeppy, it isn't my favorite of these few. Like I said, my favorite is number three. But we're going to plot this on the drip calculator and compare it to the S&P 500. So this kicks up this little window for us and we can see exactly how it has performed. So compared to SPY, it is not a winner in either category, which is very, very interesting. Um, it's definitely important to note that that this over time has not performed as well as SPY since 2020. So with uh, dividends reinvested, we can see that your total return would be 13% versus 17.5% against SPY. And with dividends not reinvested, we get an 11.67% return with JEPI and 17.04%. So you do get a better return overall with dividends reinvested when JEPI is compared to itself when it's not reinvested. But still, it's not beating SPY. But again, if you're looking at some of these covered call ETFs, they're usually more so based for cash flow, not for that continual growth. And SPY has been doing really, really well. One thing that is important to note is that when you look at these charts, we know SPY is blue, JEPI is the black. And so it is a little bit, I wouldn't say it's less risky, but it is more consistent. So it, its highs are not as high as SPY and the lows are typically not as low. Um, so there's a little bit more volatility, but SPY has just been doing really well. And when it comes to these covered call ETFs, they don't have the growth that just normal stock does. And so you're going to miss out on that. You're going to miss out on price appreciation when there is a stock doing well or when uh, the market overall has been doing really well, because that's not how these covered call ETFs are, are wired to make money. If you are in a market that's trading sideways, then these will perform extremely well. But if you're looking for growth and dividends, JEPI just isn't the one for you. And that's just my opinion. But again, I do still enjoy this fund. 
So I'm currently on JP Morgan's website for JEPI and some interesting stuff to see here. We can see that the NAV, we can see their year to date uh, income, 30 day SEC yield, which is a little bit low under 7%. And one thing that is really, really important is the expense ratio. So for those of you that don't know, if a fund is actively managed like these ETFs are because people have to buy and sell these option calls and track all of the records, it, it costs money to own. And so that is another downside when you're looking at ETFs versus just typical stocks like REITs or even BDCs. We have a 0.35% ratio, expense ratio. And that is relative it's not terrible but it's not great i would say it's it's average maybe a little bit above average even there are some that have extremely low ratios like 0 0.01 0 0.02 like really low so 35 is definitely up there but i've also seen some that have a 0.99 like i think the yield max funds have nine almost a full percent expense ratio um, but from there we're going to jump into the fact sheet and this is going to give us just a little bit of a look at the premium ETF from JP Morgan. And we can see here their approach, generate income through a combination of selling options and investing in the U.S. large cap stock, seeking to deliver a monthly income stream from associated option premiums and stock dividends. So the diversity there is you do own a certain number, but I don't even think that they actually own these. When it comes to these ETFs, I'm not an expert and I'm not going to pretend I am. So make sure that you guys do research on these. I'm just looking at the money that's been generated. And the reason why I put JEPI on this list is because when we bought $1,000 worth of dividend stocks and ETFs in our 1K dividend account challenge for 2023, JEPI was one of the only three stocks that was profitable. And it wasn't profitable by a lot. It was only four or 5%. But compared to most of the other stocks that were negative, JEPI did shine through. So I'm not going to dive too far into a lot of this stuff. We can see some of the information that was um, already given, but the rolling 12-month dividend yield is 8.5%. It has come down over the last couple of months. The Morningstar rating gives us a five-star, which I think is good. You know, if you really trust the Morningstar companies um, and analyst reviews, that's great. I don't always, but then we can kind of see what their money is in Progressive, Microsoft, Amazon, Intuit, MasterCard, Visa, AbV, Meta, and their sectors, communication services, um, energy, a ton of uh, consumer staples, um, consumer discretionary, a lot in financials, and a lot in information technology. So they are well versed in a lot of different sectors, as we can see what the highest is a near 15%, the lowest is below a percent, um, but the actual lowest is what, 4.2.6 uh, in energy. So definitely nice to know, you know, when you're looking at these funds, to be honest, what I do, I don't care so much about what they're buying. I just care about how the fund has been performing. And that's the same thing with a lot of these ETFs, QYLD, RYLD, XYLD, JEPQ. I just want to see it making me money. And now it is important to understand the portfolio and stuff like that. But these ETFs are different than normal stocks. And they're a lot harder to understand, at least in my opinion. So PE ratio of 20.6. High, but not terrible again. Um, now, one important thing is the turnover ratio, which uh, when it comes to these ETFs, again, is, is kind of tricky to explain, but it's the amount, uh, it, it is just the amount of turnover um, by in a percent. And so we can see their holdings as well. Um, Jeppy holds 132 compared to uh, the S&P 500 that has, what, 501. So pretty interesting EPS growth, a little bit better for Jeppy. So long run, if you like JP Morgan, this is a good one for you. And it's, in my opinion, what I like to do is I own a little bit. I don't put a ton of money into it. I think it could do well, but it's not going to be like a, a home run, in my opinion. That's for the next stocks. They're higher risk, but it, but higher reward. And that's just my opinion. So now what we're going to do, we're going to look at stock number two, which is actually one that I uh, am a big fan of. Starting off oh so strong with ticker EPR. This is EPR Properties, a really interesting REIT. Something that's a little bit different, similar to Vici Properties, for those of you that are familiar with that dividend stock. Um, and it's similar in the fact that they invest in amusement-type places. So instead of owning office spaces or um, single-family homes or multi-unit properties, they own amusement parks, movie theaters, ski resorts, and other entertainment properties. So... When it comes to EPR, they do own a lot of properties. We can see that in the about section, it says 353 properties as of 2022. We will double check that when we look through the investor reports for this company. But EPR is definitely an interesting one. We can see with that strong 8.24% dividend yield, you really, 
it's hard to beat that. That for me is right in the sweet spot of high enough, but not so high that I get worried about it. Now, this price is interesting to me. The price appreciation on this one down 44% over the past five years and max they're up 112% all time. So we can see they took a huge hit during the pandemic where it lost literally what a fourth of its value. Sorry, it lost three fourths of its value from around the 80 mark to the 20 mark, which hurts, but it has come back quite nicely, which I think is really, really important. And we'll look at the dividend cut here in a second, in a second, because they did have some unfortunate cuts in the recent past, I should say, but all in all, sometimes a dividend cut can be a good thing, even though it's never, in my opinion, it's never good for shareholders. It couldn't be a good thing for the company itself when it comes to the health. So larger market cap, 3.14 billion. And we're going to take a look at all of this. But first, let's take a look at that dividend history. I warned you it was ugly. EPR's dividend history, not phenomenal, but I think they have a lot of potential and I'll just say that right off the bat. They were paying out monthly, which is great, and they're paying out 38 cents every single month. They had to cut their dividend because of the pandemic. They started paying 25 cents, upped it, and now we're at 29 cents, actually 28.50, which is... I think it's a good yield. Of course, you're looking at an over 8% yield. And even though they did have a gap where they weren't paying dividends, sometimes it's better for a company to not be paying these dividends if they can't afford it. Now, I would go out on a limb to say it's always better for them to not pay it if they can't afford it. Because then you fall into yield trap situations, which nobody likes. We can look through and see they've been paying out quite consistently every single month. I love to see that. And then we go back where they paid less. They still did pay some dividends, but there was that cut. So in between 2020 and 2021. Their uh, growth rate is going to be negative. We'll jump to the dividend scorecard. We can see the yield, the forward payout, which was their annual payout $3.42 a share, which I think is phenomenal. I would love seeing this money hit my account. I really do. Even if it is just 27 cents, you buy four shares, you're getting a dollar a month. Now, I just, it's great. I love being notified that I have been paid a dividend. It feels like free money, even though I know that it's not. Negative growth rate. The payout ratio says 70%, but REITs are tricky with payout ratios because it's not the best metric to um, understand them by. You want to look more at the NAV. But all in all, this stock, it has a lot of potential in my opinion. It isn't one that I own currently. I did own it at one point. I keep mixing things up, but I do think I will be purchasing this one soon. It's very similar, like I said, to Vici Properties, and I, I'm hopeful for these REITs to come back once these rates drops, rates drop, but let's look at the um, drip calculator and see just how well this thing's been performing. This is just a thing of beauty. So EPR, had you invested $10,000 into EPR versus SPY in 1997, EPR, your total return would be 1,300% versus 750% for SPY with those dividends reinvested. So your $10,000 investment would be worth $139,000. And SPY's return is still phenomenal. Your $10,000 would be worth $85,000. Now, if we don't reinvest those dividends, which I am a huge proponent, like I said, of reinvesting dividends, we can see you would still end with 60, almost $60,000 for EPR. You'd end up more with SPY because SPY, you would have $63,000. So this is just a quick snippet to show you exactly how this stuff works and if a company has been performing well over time. But look at the price appreciation of EPR. Even when they cut their dividend, they still outperform SPY had you been reinvesting those dividends. So definitely something to note. I do like SPY. So when you're looking at EPR versus something like JEPI, you have to realize the differences and why you would own each because they are very different. And I would definitely advise you to look into them more so before purchasing. Now we're getting into the meat of EPR. We are in their portfolio overview. We can see they have almost 7 billion in total investments, 359 locations, and 200 plus tenants in 44 states and Canada. So here's some of the things that they own. Theaters, attractions like water parks, ski resorts, you know, top golf, phenomenal, really took off recently. Um, gaming and gaming like this is I believe they're talking about casinos, not, you know, um, online gaming. And then you have experiential log lodging. Man, I cannot talk today. Experiential lodging, which would be nicer resorts, things that are different off the beaten path, not just your normal motel or hotel, cultural fitness and wellness, and then private schools and early education centers, which I did not know about that. That is really, really interesting. Private schools is a big one. In my opinion, I'm guessing this looks like British International School of Chicago. Um, very interesting because schools are a tough one. You'd get a tenant for a long time, but it would be hard to fill a tenant, say, if a school closed. Uh, but these are definitely some interesting, interesting properties. So now what we're going to look at is we're going to jump straight into their investor center and check some check out their financial standings. 
So this investor presentation is not bad in nature, but this setup is just terrible. I don't like this one bit, how you go through slides. Some people might enjoy this. I'm not a fan. Let's see how this looks. No, we're not. We can't even go. I guess we are full screen. I don't know. This is a little bit messy. I don't always judge these companies too hard based on their website layout, but this is not one that I would favor. I just like the typical one, but maybe that's just me. Maybe people like the more showy kind, but their Q3 or Q4 of 2023 headlines. So their investment spending was 133.9 million with the year end total at 270 million. So they had 77 million mortgage note related to three premier resort and day spas in the Northeast US. 9.4 million in the acquisition of a climbing gym in Belmont, CA. So one thing with these experimental properties, they need to keep acquiring things. And that's hard to do when interest rates are so high because they are paying some insane, insane payments on their loans. Because can you imagine buying a property like this for $9.4 million and you're paying seven to 8% on that? And they'll probably get better rates than that because they are huge companies. But still, when interest rates go up and it costs more to borrow money, these companies will struggle. REITs as a whole have been struggling more because of that. Um, so we can see their guidance for 2024. They think that their common share guidance from 476 to 496, 3.2% increase at the midpoint over 2023. They're spending guidance 200 to 300 million. So they're going to spend roughly the same amount, which I think is good. I like when they continue to spend. And um, now we're going to jump out to, again, this terrible presentation. It's like pick, take a guess on which stocks would be useful. They think there's an estimated $100 billion market, which I would agree. Now, the tough thing with these kind of venues is you're going to struggle when we're in recessions, when money is tough to come by. Um, so I'm just clicking through this portfolio. This is not the best way to do it. And like I said, it's because this thing has a really weird layout, but I do think it is, it is important. Look at the rent coverage. This is, this is really important always for REITs. Total portfolio coverage is 2.2 X versus what they were looking at for the year 2019. So they have grown a bit and they are doing better. We can see theaters, Man, that is hard to read. Um, but corporate responsibility, a lot of jargon in here. You guys, you don't really need to go through and look at absolutely everything. I like looking at the portfolio. So 166 theaters. So that other slide wasn't even talking about the total theaters. Eat and play, attraction, ski, experimental lodging, gaming. Only one, which is not bad. Um, and so they're trying to reduce theaters. This is key. This is key. It's extremely interesting to me because theaters have been doing better. You know, they have been doing better since the pandemic, but the pandemic showed how fragile that industry is because boom, they're the first things to go. And when you look at theaters as a long term, I do think they'll always be around. I don't think they're going to go under by any means, but everything is available on streaming services now. You can literally stream movies in theaters on your TV in your bedroom. It, it is wild. So I think it is good to reduce their number of theaters. Plus they are oversaturated in the theater space. 166 properties is a lot. And now I'm guessing theaters are relatively cheaper compared to ski resorts and experimental lodging, of course. But it is still important to note that they're going to be cutting back on that, which I think is good. And they're cutting back on the schools as well. And the rest they're trying to grow. So they're trying to grow the top golf. They're trying to grow gaming, fitness. So I think overall, great. Very great very great portfolio, a little bit higher risk now until they get rid of the theaters. But overall, I, I wouldn't necessarily complain. So we'll see if there's anything else I want to pick through when it comes to this presentation. Again, this is one of the absolute worst presentations I've ever looked at. Um, not the slides themselves, but this layout, I'm going to continue to complain about it. Um, debt maturity profile, you can barely even read this thing. It's so bad. And this is important. Unsecured senior notes. So they have a lot of unsecured senior notes, some private placement notes and secured debt, which is just here. Um, I would like a little bit more secured debt, of course. And they only have 136 million in debt maturities in 2024, which it looks like is a bit lower. Yeah, quite a bit lower than um, they're forecasting for the coming years. So something to note, something interesting. Total revenue. Total revenue is a big one. Looks like they were down total revenue in 2023 versus 2022, which isn't surprising to me. So what happened with a lot of these, if you think about what this company owns, they own all these experimental properties like um, resorts. After the pandemic, everyone started spending their money. Everyone spent as much money as they could and traveled as much as they could because we were so tired of being locked up all the time. 
So seeing a little bit of a come down from 2022 to 2023 isn't the worst. Um, it's not good. It would have been better, of course, if they had done well, but that's one that I would definitely say is understandable. And so their total revenue 2022 to 2023 was up, um, which we're not surprised by. I'm guessing this is in millions. So they were up about 50 million from one year to the other, which is pretty good. It is a bigger company with that market cap of over 3 billion, but still. Let's just click through. Oh, is this important? 2.8 total debt. A lot of debt. A lot of debt. Weighted average of 4.3. So when they're buying companies, they're getting a, a really good APR, which I think is important. And um, something to note, of course, it, it is crippling to some of these REITs when they have to pay more on their interest, but it looks like they're doing all right. So that's where I'm going to call it on EPR. Now we're jumping into my personal favorite, the highest risk, highest reward, the one you have all been waiting for. Let's talk about ticker HRZN. So recently, HRZN has been taking a bit of a beating. It dropped roughly, what, 10%? Um, just a couple of weeks ago, which I'm not a fan of, of course, but when you have an 11.17% dividend yield, you are going to have to be prone to some high, high risk. And we can see that this is not uncommon for the company as it often will drop and then run like mad. I'm not saying it's going to run now, but you never know with this company. That's just the thing. So it is down 1.4% on the last year, down 10% the last five years, but it did hit a high of 17 at one point, And since then it's down 34%. With, with their max chart being down 24% all time. So for those of you that don't know, HRZN is a BDC. So they provide financing with, um, which is interesting. I actually read a little bit down here about it. Let's look about it. So it provides structured debt products to life science and technology companies. I like that. I like that it's life science and tech compared to just normal businesses. Science and tech usually, I mean, in the past decades has done well. But again, it's not indicative of the future just because it did well in the past. Some places rank it low. Tip Ranks has been ranking it low. I checked. They've been ranking it as like a sell for like, I don't know, like five or six years. And in that time, yeah, you've been down 10%, but dividends have been 11%. So it's, it is interesting. It's definitely higher risk. This one was not for any, for everybody. Let me know what you guys think in the comments if this is too risky for you, but let's jump into that dividend history. HRZN's dividend history is pretty phenomenal in my in my opinion. So they have not cut. They have consecutive dividend payments of 11 years and years of consecutive growth is two. So they aren't growing the dividend quite crazily, but they do pay out these special dividends kind of similar to Main Street Capital, which I think is a huge deal. So you're getting paid already 11 cents a month and then some months they just pay you an extra five cents. Now I've owned HRZN, so I am biased and I do know that it's very speculative. This is not a low risk stock. BDCs are risky and this is probably one of the riskier BDCs, but special dividends over and over and over again, it's almost like they're consistent. So I love the special dividends they pay out. It makes it so they're paying out 15 or 16 um, cents for that month instead of just the 10 or 11. Now look at the dividend scorecard. Payout ratio, 67%, phenomenal. And I like, I say that, you know, with a little bit of sass, but people are rating this as a sell and there may be reasons why, but I struggle to find them. I know it's high risk, but 11% yield forward payout is a dollar 32 payout ratio again, 67%. And then the five-year growth rate, 1.92 and dividend growth is two years. Maybe the growth rate is why people are saying to sell, but I just don't really get it. And if we look at the dividend safety, a bunch of information that's not even there. So it's definitely interesting. Uh, I want to look at the drip calculator. That will tell us more about this company. So let's take a look. So it's starting to be a clear picture. Maybe why people don't like this one as much. It has underperformed SPY. So when I look for dividend stocks, I primarily focus on ones that outperform SPY, but some I do hold just for the cash flow. Now, HRZN hasn't had a terrible time. They've been trading or at least it goes back historically to 2010, your return on $10,000 would be almost $30,000. You're looking at a near 200% total return, but SPY in that same amount of time has done 450% return, more than double. So that is something that is important to note. It's not one that I would say you go all in on. And then when we don't have dividends reinvested, the disparity is even higher. The dividends being reinvested is what's key with HRZN. And what's nice is you can continue to grow that yield with compounding interest, especially if you're in a tax exempt account but all in all it looks like spy outperforms this one or at least has it has it in the past now the interesting thing is it, it goes quite along with spy but of course you get that dividend yield 
but definitely an interesting chart. Let me know what you guys think about HRZN and compare it to EPR. EPR so far is our only one of three that actually beats SPY, so I'm genuinely curious what you guys think. So HRZN's website is pretty interesting. We can see that they do have their full Q4 records for 2023. So we're just going to look at their at their Q4, see what it says. Um, so we can see that their net income per share was 45 cents, NAV per share of 971, annual debt portfolio yield of 16.6%. And then we have, they ended the year committing a backlog of 218 million with their regularly monthly distributed totaling 33 cents per share through June, 2024 and a five cent special distribution payable in April of 2024. Definitely, definitely some interesting information. Net income of a hundred or sorry, of 15 million, which I like to see. This is just the quarter results. So it is nice to see some of these things, but then you can see the full year highlights in some of them as well. So investment income of 61.4 million or almost $2 per share compared to only 36.2 million or a dollar 46 per share for 2022. So a huge jump in net investment income. Their portfolio yield on debt investment of 16.6, which is again, really insanely high. And they funded 33 loans that were 241.6 million and experienced liquidity events from 20 portfolio companies. So that is important. And then they say here, we capped 2023 with another quarter of our debt portfolio yield, continue to generate net investment income that exceeded our distributions. So this is just a lot. It's a lot of financial jargon. I'm not going to go through all of this, but there is some stuff that I want to look at. Um, of course, the numbers always catch my eye. We can see they, they did much better in the beginning portfolio in 2023 versus 2022. And new net and sorry new debt and equity investments a little bit lower than it has been the past couple of years and net loss on investments kind of meh unrealized appreciation on investments you know uh, it's kind of just meh a lot of the financials for this company are kind of meh i'll give them that the dividend history like i said is phenomenal the special dividends is phenomenal the price action is meh so this is kind of it, it's definitely an interesting stock but it is again much higher risk than a lot of people are comfortable with investing so i think that that is really really important to note we can see through december 2022 all the way to 2023 their total number of investments has gone down by four and their debt investments at fair value has also trailed down just a little bit so not what you really want to see when it comes to a bdc you want to see them continuing to grow continuing to, to do better now i wouldn't say this is a terrible company just based off the fact that they went down in their number of investments and a little bit of their investments at fair value because they did continue to pay out that dividend but, you know, with dividend cuts always on the horizon for some of these BDCs, it is risky. And, and HRZN is a higher risk BDC because you are getting that tech and, and healthcare side of things that is, it's not even cyclical. It's just high risk. There's a lot of competition. There's always new players in the game. So that is definitely something that I think would be important to look at. So the net asset value was $324 million or $9.71 per share compared to, let's see, three eighteen, dollars which was December 2022. So the net assets have not gone up by much. What's that? About $6 million, $5.6 million, uh, $5 million in a full year when it's a, third, a $300 million company. So like I said, their growth is less. Stock repurchase program, I love when they buy back stocks. It usually kicks everything up and they bought back 167,000 shares at 11.22 cents. That cost 1.9 million. So buybacks are always good. That took place late in December 31. So their management is making some good decisions. And I think that is really important to note. So I'm not going to keep reading through all of this stuff. We saw how they've been paying out each these 11 cents per month, which we love to see and those special dividends. All in all, I like I said, this is what I'm just biased on. If you don't like it, let me know why because I'm genuinely curious what people think about this. Um, some people love it, some people hate it. The analysts seem to really not like this one, but all in all, it's up to you guys. And then now we're gonna look at that bonus stock. So let's take a look. 
All right, guys, we are doing this all in one take. I got to get this one quick. This video has gone on for too long. CCI, Crown Castle. I did a full five-minute DD video on this one, and I will link that here at the end of the video and, or down below in the description if you are interested. Now, it's down. It's, it is really, really beaten down. It's why I'm kind of obsessing over the stock. It's almost 50% beaten down just in the last three years. This all-time chart is beautiful. What they do is they own... This is another REIT. It doesn't pay monthly, but it's got a 5.6% dividend yield and a phenomenal dividend history with some of the most most insane dividend growth out there but cci they own all of these telecommunication towers so cell phone towers they own these and they lease them to companies like verizon at&t t-mobile all of these companies rely on these towers and so because rates have been killing these guys and that they have to finance a lot when it comes to building new towers and tower construction and tower repair that has been hurting them so i think because this is a reit and reits and rates should be dropping down this thing could perform extremely well the dividend history started out at 35 cents and they're now paying out a dollar 57 a quarter and that's not even the best part dividend growth three-year growth rate of 8.3 and a five-year of almost eight absolutely insane just to throw it in we're going to compare it to spy cci throw that in here let's see how the s p 500 did compared to it yep just as i thought you have dividends plus growth you have a 1900 percent return in the same time spy performed 724 percent now i'm not knocking spy that's of course with dividends reinvested and total return this is the beautiful part even without dividends reinvested 1800 percent return versus 500 percent when you're looking at spy absolutely insane i hope you guys enjoyed the video drop a like drop a subscribe if you did and i'll see you in the next one